locked inside this rubble are gems of incomparable beauty and value. They're the world's oldest substance and are made almost entirely of carbon. Diamonds, transparent stones that come from the center of the earth, the sea, and the sky. Now, Diamond Mines on Modern Marvels. From above, it looks like the landing site of an enormous UFO. But in reality, this is one of the most prolific open pit diamond mines in the world. In a remote part of Botswana, deep in the Kalahari Desert, the De Beers Company and the government of Botswana are digging for gem quality diamonds. Last year, this mine, the Juanang Mine, extracted over 11 million carats of diamonds from 9 million tons of treated ore. Juane Mine obviously is one of the richer mines or the richest mines in, in the world at this point in time. What you do is you dig down to a certain level. So you're digging down into that sort of volcanic cone, if you like. And you need to get to the kimberlitic part of it, the kimberlite ore. That contains the diamonds. So you're going in at these angles. Now, in order that the the, the walls, if you like, of this open pit mine don't fall in themselves. You go, you stagger it down in a, in a series of terraces. Terraces, like something you'd see in the Roman Colosseum, ring the interior of the pit. Mining is done on these benches, as well as on the mine's floor. At the base of the pit, ore is removed by hydraulic shovels and loaded on to 170-ton capacity trucks for transport. Waste material is trucked to dumps. Diamond-bearing ore is transported to a crusher. Experts say that 250 tons of rock are mined for every diamond that's recovered. Once the open pit is exhausted of diamonds, explosives are set to break up the hard rock, and miners go underground. In bedrock adjacent to the funnel where the diamonds are, Miners sink a vertical opening called a shaft. Horizontal tunnels join the main shaft to the working areas. Drilling takes place toward the diamond-bearing ore. Rock between the tunnels is blasted, removing the support from the overlying ore so that it caves in. Now the pieces of rock are small enough to be removed from the troughs at the production level. Here, the rock is broken and transported to underground crushers before being carried to the surface. Conveyor belts, which were first used in the 1920s, move the ore out of the mine. The first stop is the main treatment plant, where the crushed ore is washed and screened. Next, the concentrate moves on to a building called the aquarium. This three-tower building consists of a floor for sorting, a floor for recovery of diamonds, and a bulk acid holding plant. From this point, the ore moves around in sealed containers. The rule here is, what can't be seen can't be stolen. Our first principle was to actually separate people, um, a physical separation of people actually from, from where there was a high concentrate of diamonds. Our process is actually hands off. Automation has actually ensured that it, that happens. Using high technology equipment, rough diamonds are automatically sorted, cleaned, sized, weighed, and packaged. Hidden surveillance cameras monitor the entire operation. In this control room, men track the flow of material by computer and watch for a security breach. They can see which doors have been opened, at what time, and for how long. Employees are photographed each time they go through a secure area. In high-risk areas where a diamond might be swallowed, they're also x-rayed. Once the diamonds are fully recovered, they travel by overhead conveyor through the plant and into an area so protected, it's off limits to film crews. Why all this fuss over an element that is totally carbon, just like the graphite you find in a pencil? 
because diamonds have been treasured by mankind for over 3,000 years. And because seven billion dollars worth of raw diamonds are sold every year. That translates into 50 billion dollars worth of jewelry. But of the millions of diamonds purchased each year, few new owners know their rock's true history. Diamonds have to form at extremely high temperature and extremely high pressure. And the only place on Earth you find this is deep underground, perhaps a hundred miles below the surface of the Earth. And their carbon atoms slowly come together. They form larger and larger crystals. We know that some of those crystals may be the size of, of a soccer ball or maybe a watermelon even. Over billions of years, at intense heat and unimaginable pressure, Diamonds crystallize miles underground. They hitch a ride to the Earth's surface inside a carrot-shaped funnel called a kimberlite pipe. Kimberlite pipes contain minerals, including diamonds. Small volcanic explosions hoist the pipe to Earth's surface at Mach 1 speed. The famous pipe in Kimberley, South Africa, discovered in the late 1800s, was 450,000 square feet across and 3,500 feet deep. Our knowledge of diamonds was acquired slowly. In 1772, French chemist Antoine Lavoisier shattered the myth that diamonds couldn't burn. He focused the sun's rays through a big circular lens and trained it on a small diamond sitting in a glass bowl filled with oxygen. And lo and behold, after a couple of minutes, the thing began smoking, then it began smoldering, and then after a while, it was just a little pile of cinders, ashes to ashes, just like people. He discovered that diamond converted to carbon dioxide, and yet he never made that, ex that next step, the step that would suggest that carbon was, was what diamond is made of, that diamond is simply a pure form of carbon. The discovery of what diamonds are composed of fell to British chemist Smithson Tennant in the early 1800s. He took a very carefully weighed amount of diamond on the one hand, and then took the same weight of graphite or of charcoal on the other hand, and burned each of those in the way that Lavoisier had done, and showed that in each case you produce exactly the same amount of carbon dioxide. That proved beyond any doubt that both diamond and this black graphite, the soft material of pencil lead, were chemically identical, even though they looked so completely different. The birth date of a diamond remained a mystery until the 1880s, because carbon, beyond a certain age, can't be dated. Then, scientists learned to date trace minerals found inside the ancient stone. It was discovered that diamonds were actually often much older than the kimberlite which they were found. Kimberlite is just the host of diamonds, the vehicle to get diamonds to the surface of the Earth. At 3.3 billion years of age, diamonds are almost as old as Earth itself. The first diamond miners in India in the 4th century BC only saw a glittering curiosity. Miners digging in the Krishna River gravel of southern India thought diamonds grew in the sand. After the rainy season, people would just flock to the riverbanks and begin sifting sand or, or whatever kind of material was there for diamonds. Rough diamonds, which look like pieces of dirty glass, were thought to have magical properties. These ran the gamut from, from uh, bringing dead animals back to, back to life, to telling whether your, your mate was committing adultery, to making the wary invisible, to giving you courage, to, to putting out fires, anything you could imagine. India's diamond production reached its zenith in the 16th century, with a maximum output of between 50,000 and 100,000 carats. But that volume was almost eclipsed by the discovery of great diamond deposits in Brazil in 1725, on the Rio dos Marinos River. Using a wooden washing pan, fine sand and clay was flushed away, and the diamonds were picked out by hand from the remaining heavy minerals. Between 1730 and 1822, it's estimated that Brazil produced almost three million carats of diamonds. Neither Brazil nor India would come close to the flood of diamonds found in another remote part of the world. Next, the Great South African Diamond Crush. In the 16th century, lovers wore scribbling rings made of diamond. They were used to etch romantic notes on window panes. 
Diamond Mines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Diamond Mines on Modern Marvels. In 1866, the great South African diamond rush made world headlines. It began when 15-year-old Aramis Jacobs spotted a transparent stone on his father's farm on the south bank of the Orange River. That stone was a 21-carat diamond. People just rushed to South Africa, and uh, at that time transportation was not very good, so the, it took them about three or four months to get there. Within a year, a feverish mix of American veterans of the Civil War, Eastern and Western Europeans, and Canadians swarmed the Cape of Good Hope to mine diamonds. The black diggers were basically hired labor, and they were sent in to do the dirty work. And it's not that the white guys didn't do the, the job too. Everybody was uh, out there in the flies and the sun and the sewage. Diamonds were hand-washed from the alluvial or riverbed pebbles. What happened after that was people began fanning out into the back country, away from the rivers, in hopes that they might find diamonds there. And indeed they did. In 1869, the practice of dry digging for diamonds was born. These images were filmed by Thomas Edison in Kimberley, South Africa in 1917. The deeper they dug, the more that it appeared that the diamonds had come from below, not been washed from above, and that perhaps this was the mother rock. 20 miles north lay a farm owned by Dutch settlers named De Beers. On their property, miners found large rough diamonds like nothing they'd seen before. Thomas Edison captured on film the area miners named Kimberley. It was a boom town. A 17-year-old Englishman of delicate health but with a wealth of ambition joined his older brother at the claim in Kimberley. The boy's name was Cecil Rhodes. I think people will remember Cecil Rhodes as two people, really. Um, one, he was a, a great adventurer. Uh, he certainly uh, was very active in expanding the territories of the British Empire at that time. But also he'll be remembered as being a great uh, entrepreneur. And a man keen on not becoming a miner. It was extremely dangerous. Uh, many people were killed. Uh, there are eyewitness reports of, of huge piles of rock rumbling down the hillside and burying miners. Sometimes the, the neighbor would find his predecessor's body somewhere in a shaft. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of, of individual diggers there. It was a very chaotic scene. Uh, imagine, if you will, something like a, a gold rush uh, kind of era. It was a real wild west town. The only thing that could have made it more dangerous was the use of dynamite, which would come into use in 1900. The land was divided into 31-foot square prospects. Roadways separated the claims. It is said to be the largest hand excavation in human history. The works of ancient Babylonia and Egypt not accepted. With thousands of feet honeycombed with pockets, the yellow earth of Kimberley began to give way. Everybody was getting flooded out, so Cecil Rhodes got a hold of the only pump for about 600 miles around and rented it out and made a fortune. Frequent cave-ins smothered hopes of easy riches. As miners gave up, they sold their claims to Cecil Rhodes. It was amongst this chaos that Cecil Rhodes saw that the best way of taking this industry forward and without it destroying itself there and then was for all the producers to come together. By the age of 27, Rhodes was the largest mine owner in Kimberley. As for the brothers De Beers, they sold their farm for a mere 6,000 pounds, leaving behind only their name. Cecil Rhodes borrowed the De Beers name when he squeezed out his only real competitor, Barney Barnato. The strategy used by both sides was quite different because, on the one hand, Barnato actually had more money than Rhodes at this time. Rhodes pushed for a partnership with Barnato. A financial battle ensued, and ultimately Rhodes won the day. He merged the holdings of both men into De Beers Consolidated Diamond Mining. With Rhodes' subsequent purchase of the now famous Deutzspan and Bullfontein diamond pipe mines, Rhodes controlled more than 95% of the world's diamonds by the turn of the century. To ensure the present and future value of diamonds, 
Cecil Rhodes began a movement towards centralized control of their production and release, a move that had no precedent in world economic practice. He predicated the volume of diamonds he'd release for market on the number of marriages every year in the United States, for engagement rings were the bulk of the diamond gem market. Distribution of his diamonds would go through a single channel. The birth of what we uh, came to know as single channel marketing was really in 1890, um, a couple of years after the establishment of De Beers Consolidated. And this was when a group of diamantes based here in Haddon Garden came together and created the London Diamond Syndicate. And this syndicate basically took the production from the De Beers mines and marketed them onto the world. The stage was set for an up-and-comer to reap the rewards of Cecil Rhodes' plan. Ernest Oppenheimer moved to London, um, worked for a company called Duncan Spuller with his uncle, and eventually in 1902, just shortly after the death of Cecil Rhodes, went down to Kimberley and began buying diamonds from De Beers to sell back through his uncle's firm. In Kimberley, Oppenheimer saw the gradual erosion of the diamond industry. Single-channel marketing worked well as long as this one area produced 95% of the world's diamonds. But new producers from Angola, the Congo, and Namibia were pumping diamonds onto the world market, which would ultimately force the price of diamonds down. With backing from financier J.P. Morgan, Oppenheimer formed the Anglo-American Corporation to exploit a gold field in Africa's East Witwatersrand. In the meantime, the onset of World War I drove the diamond industry down. Money was spent on staples, not on diamonds. When Oppenheimer returned to South Africa in the 1920s, he was in a position to buy up some diamond claims along the west coast of Namibia. Later, he traded that mine for De Beers stock and seized control of the company. In 1926, he became a De Beers director. In 1929, he was its chairman. By then, he had taken the diamond business to its next level. He not only controlled the world's diamond supply, he controlled the key players who would sell it. This allowed him then to go on to create his vision of long-term stability within the industry. And this is when, in, the, in 1930, we see the bringing together again of all these producers now and the creation of what became known as the Central Selling Organization. Okay, look, I guarantee 250, yeah? The Oppenheimer family successfully ran De Beers as a cartel right into the 21st century, even though it meant they would be legally prevented from doing business on U.S. soil. Only recently has the diamond monopoly lost its vice-like grip. A proliferation of diamond mines outside of De Beers' control has, at last, begun to erode the giant's dominion over the world's most precious gem. Next, Russia puts the first cracks in De Beers' ice empire. African rebels illegally mine 4% of the world's diamonds. Because of the gem's association with violence, they're called blood diamonds. Diamond mines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to diamond mines on Modern Marvels. The Oppenheimers had controlled the world's diamond supply for almost a century when communist Russia entered the arena in 1947. In 1954, the first kimberlite pipe was found in Siberia. In 1955, two more pipes were discovered within 10 days of each other. The Russian mine Akil is one of the richest on earth. Not in terms of the volume of material that is produced, but because of the, the, uh, the, the large percentage of gem quality diamonds. These are perfect octahedra, beautifully clear stones. To reach the stones, one must go through ground that has been permanently frozen since the last ice age, which lasted from about 1.6 million years to 10,000 years ago. In these extreme Arctic wilderness conditions, a spring day, is minus 30 degrees. Mining in these areas uh, posed an entirely new operational vista in term and an engineering challenge. And the reason was that, that once um, permafrost is opened up, and for exa example, when houses are built on the permafrost, the warmth from the house will tend to melt the, the ground under you and the foundations will give way correspondingly. 
The task became keeping the ground permanently frozen so that the foundations of what was built on the permafrost wouldn't sink and fall apart. When it came to the scale of a mine, the challenge was formidable. They wrapped the pylons essentially in, um, uh, in a hot water blanket material and at enormous cost and essentially kept the pylons, uh, kept the pylons cold. And there were two, there were only two alternatives. You either keep them hot or you keep them cold, but you have to keep them permanently in that way. The Soviet Union threatened to flood the world's markets with their diamonds. De Beers moved swiftly and bought up their stockpile. That arrangement collapsed in 1991, along with the fall of the Soviet Empire. While some portion of diamond production remained with De Beers, a percentage is now sold outside the De Beers cartel weakening its position as the only true supplier of gem-quality diamonds. The latest entry into the multi-billion dollar diamond industry is Canada. Back in the late 1970s, a British Columbian geologist started taking samples in the tundra of Canada's Northwest Territories. Skeptics thought he was mad as a hatter. But Chuck Fipke was a true Indiana Jones. He followed Kimberlite trails until he found their source at the bottom of a lake. In 1985, I was collecting a, a sample uh, just right over, right over there on that esker, and uh, uh, we uh, we took the sample back to the lab in Kelowna, and uh, we found it had about 5,000 uh, kimberlitic pyros and 1,700 chrome dioxides, which are are minerals that come out of diamond-bearing kimberlites. With money borrowed from working-class friends. Fipke and fellow geologist Stu Bluson staked out an area just smaller than Rhode Island. After years of failure and often on the brink of bankruptcy, in 1991, the stubborn geologists struck it rich. Now in partnership with BHP Minerals, a huge mining company, the Canadian mine known as Ikati is providing close to 4% of the world's diamonds by weight and 5% by value. The gems coming out of Ekati are some of the highest quality gem diamonds in the world. These kimberlite pipes are under lakes. To prep them for mining, they're emptied of fish and then drained. Basically, you just dig a big hole, and you dig a hole that's wider than the, the pipe, of course, because you have to go down and sort of, you have to have a roadway to go down into this thing. Using a steam shovel about three stories high, tons of diamond ore is scooped up from the former lake bed and dumped into a huge truck. At a nearby plant, the ore is run through a series of sieves and rollers and other equipment that crushes it up. They don't want to crush it up too much, of course, because they'll, they'll crush any diamonds in there. In a final step, the heavier diamondiferous material is put through a device which x-rays every little particle as it goes down a conveyor belt. The diamonds will fluoresce, but diamonds aren't all they x-ray. They do everything from x-raying your, uh, your laptop computer and your boots to putting you through a, a little airlock device which uh, takes a look at your body just to make sure that you don't have any diamonds on you. Fipke and Bluson's early shoestring investors are now millionaires, and the geologists each have a net worth close to half a billion dollars. They're still wearing the same ratty old shoes and pants. They're in some ways not touched at all. Where are diamonds found? An obvious answer is around a kimberlite pipe. But once that kimberlite host weathers, diamonds are found in riverbeds and the sea. In 1961, a Texas businessman explored shallow water sea mining adjacent to the coastal strip north of the Orange River, known today as Namibia. In 1967, De Beers took over from this early prospector and began taking samples. By 1970, they were able to sample sediments in water of up to 656 feet. Their efforts led to the discovery of a diamond deposit in the Atlantic Ocean on the middle continental shelf. The diamonds had been carried to the Atlantic as the land surface eroded over millions of years. Within 10 years, De Beers had recovered over 400,000 carats of diamonds from the sea, mining at a maximum depth of 500 feet. The first challenge in deep sea mining is removing the gravel from the seabed. The gravel in which the diamonds are preserved uh, or, or concentrated is literally sucked up as a vacuum cleaner would suck up material. De Beers mining ships are converted oil rigs with a hole in the middle of the boat. And it was through that that, uh, that the suction mechanism 
is, is, is put and then lowered onto the seabed and uh, the, the gravel is then, is then brought up into that. That's partially concentrated, which is the great advantage of that ship. It, the, the initial concentration is done on board, the waste material is thrown overboard, and the ship progressively moves up and down. There are two methods to suck gravel from the sea. The horizontal system uses a seabed crawler. Gravel is brought onto the ship through flexible slurry hoses. The vertical system consists of a large diameter rotating drill bit. The system actually lifts the gravel from the seabed to the ship. It's possible to go back to the same primary holes, glory holes as they're called, in which, which are irregularities in the basement of the sea floor, and these are recharged after a big storm, and they're recharged with diamonds, and so they can go back again periodically, suck the material up, and, um, and it will be diamond bearing again. On board, the gravel is separated into three sizes by a screening process. The smallest size is mostly waste quartz and is discarded. The largest size rarely yields diamonds and is washed overboard from the ship. The middle size is processed to separate the heavy minerals, including diamond, from the light waste mineral. The remaining concentrate passes through an x-ray machine, which further separates the fluorescent diamonds from the rest of the material. After the final sort, the diamonds are ready for transport. And then they're put on, on, uh, on motorboats, motor launches, and then taken ashore. From diamond mine to jewelry store, only the best stones will make the grade. Next, the hands-on process of sorting diamonds into 16,000 different categories. Today, diamonds are mined in about 25 countries, on every continent but Europe and Antarctica. Diamond mines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Diamond Mines on Modern Marvels. This is Gaborone, the capital city of Botswana. The prosperity of this region is due to the country's rich diamond deposits. Diamonds from Juanang Mine are sorted and valued in this building. What we're doing at this end of the floor is valuing large diamonds into one of many hundreds of classifications by color, quality, shape. Diamonds are first separated into gem quality, near gem quality, and industrial grade. The purpose of sorting is to estimate an asking price for the rough diamonds. A sorter's initial training lasts six months. If he's not maybe very good at sorting, we don't, uh, that's when we just say to them bye-bye. Experienced sorters can make 16,000 different classifications, like color, size, weight, model, clarity, grade, and every subcategory they're in. Small stones are sorted by computer. Human hand sorters used to face so-called run-of-mine diamonds, which included every classification. Whereas now, we have uh, machines actually helping us to sort about 60%. Diamonds that pass through this room represent 70% of the gross domestic product of Botswana, a whopping $4 billion. So it's a huge earner, um, um, dollar-wise, for um, Botswana and the economy and it has transformed the economy over the last 20 years. Sorted rough diamonds are offered for sale in London by De Beers 10 times a year. An elite 125 diamond jewelry manufacturers are invited to these events. You go to London and they will show you the kind of goods that you are experienced to manufacture and you can handle it and you have the proper distribution and they will award you a site accordingly. The De Beers site holders manufacture many of the most exquisite pieces of diamond jewelry on the market. These are compilations of years and years of housing and, and, and holding an inventory until you actually have enough stones because what happens is that a lot of the diamonds have to match each other. This fancy yellow diamond necklace took three years to assemble. Its yellow color comes from traces of nitrogen. The color increases its value. It wholesales for $1.2 million and retails for $2.4 million. There's a lot of royalty around today with the, uh, the Arab world and some of the other countries, the emerging countries. There are individuals who are in a position to buy these. 
Stones are matched by color, clarity, and shape. The piece here in the middle is, uh, is a tiara as well as a necklace. It's shown here as a tiara. Um, it's got pear shapes and rounds and some marquees and some smaller pear shapes, yellow pear shapes, white pear shapes. Most of the stones in this tiara are graded D, flawless. These are... These are signature... These are like paintings. Yeah, these are signature pieces for us, though. People will recognize that there's only a few select companies in the world that can assemble something like that. The metamorphosis from rough-cut diamond to gemstone begins in the expert hands of the diamond cleaver. Each diamond is cut to maximize the weight of the stone while still ridding it of flaws. Smaller diamonds of lesser value are often cut by laser. So if you see something inside of the stone that's not going to look good in the main stone, somehow you want to, uh, you know, saw that off or cleave it off and make two stones. But always you're trying to look for the biggest, the best stone. You've got to let the stone tell you what it wants to be made into. Diamond cutters apprentice alongside a master for five years. Harvey Lieberman trained with his father. Now I'm going to take this uh, rough stone, it's approximately eight carats. Nothing's been done to it as of yet. And what I'm going to do is make uh, an initial facet on where I think the uh, largest surface area is on the top of the stone called the table. I'm going to set it in cement like that, find the uh, where the grain is on the stone and put it down on the wheel. The first patent on a diamond wheel was issued in 1878. The wheel then looked like it looks today. To cut a facet requires something as hard as the diamond itself. Master cutters use diamond powder. This is a loose diamond powder. I'll take the diamond powder and you either apply it with some glue or some linseed oil and work it in with another diamond. So one part of the wheel will cut the facet down here. When the diamond is finished cutting, when I'm done with the facet, I want to take off the rough lines off of the surface to get a good polish, as you might see on a certificate, and have the certificate read very good. And then I'll start to polish it up here. This is a much finer powder on the top of the wheel. And that'll polish out the facet. Diamonds, like wood, have grains. Because diamond is a fairly clear material, it isn't always obvious where the grain is. It's the hardest surface, natural surface there is, so it is, uh, if it doesn't want to cut, you, you could be in for a, a difficult day. While most other stages of the diamond industry have changed with technology, the art of cutting remains in the master's hands. I'm sure the day will come when computers will be able to do do it all and they won't need me but uh, I think I'll be long gone by then. <laughs> Down the street from the Manhattan offices of Lewis Glick and Company is the Diamond District. High above the stores on West 47th Street is a small dimly lit fortress known as the European Gem Lab. Here gemologists put cut and polished diamonds through a series of tests. In the end each stone is given a certificate of authenticity that includes the stone's unique characteristics. In a professional gemological laboratory, we use zoom binocular magnification to locate external and internal characteristics that determine the clarity grade of a diamond. Identifying characteristics that can't be found under 10 power magnification are disregarded. Diamonds without inclusions or external characteristics under 10 power magnification can be graded as flawless, and they are very, very rare. Color grading involves comparing an unknown diamond to a set of master color stones that have been previously graded against an international standard. Next is the black box. Here gemologists grade the fluorescent strength and color of a diamond. This scientific machine is the Sarin Dimension Proportion Analyzer, another way to identify the diamond. The machine works by showing a shadow image of the diamond on the computer screen and the computer is analyzing the proportions from hundreds of different angles. That analysis is interpreted and outputted to our central database which then puts that information onto the EGL USA Diamond Certificate. 
The relationship of the angles, the quality of the polish, the proportion between the top of the diamond and the bottom of the diamond, the size of the table compared to the width, and many other factors go into grading the quality of the cut. Of the four C's, carat weight, clarity grade, color grade, and cutting quality, how the diamond is cut can add the most value to the diamond. There's a relatively new way to identify a diamond that involves inscription. What we're looking at right now is a technician typing in certain characters that will be inscribed with a special laser on the girdle, the thin edge of the diamond. The letters are so minute they cannot be seen with the naked eye. The machine is capable of inscribing just about anything. As a matter of fact, we can accurately reproduce logos, company logos, corporate logos, personal insignias, family crests, if you want. For security purposes, some merchants request social security numbers. Lovers request terms of endearment. The laser itself operates in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, which means there's no burning taking place of the diamond. It's perfectly safe for the diamond. We can engrave a human hair with this. We chose to inscribe this five carat diamond with our own name. A diamond like this would retail for around $93,000. But what if this diamond had been made by a machine? Next, real diamonds made by man. Diamonds are nicknamed ice, not only because they look like it, but also because they're a great conductor of heat. Put a big enough diamond on your tongue and it'll feel cold. That's because heat is being drawn away from your tongue. Diamond Mines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Diamond Mines on Modern Marvels. Ever since Smithson Tennant unlocked the secret that diamond is carbon, scientists have tried to make a diamond out of graphite. It took 150 years before they got the job done. To make diamonds, scientists in the laboratory have to mimic the deep earth. You have to get very high temperatures. And that's not so difficult. We know how to make high temperatures with fire or with electricity passing through material. You can get thousands of degrees, fairly straightforward. But you also have to get high pressure. Pressure is equivalent to a hundred mile column of rock. Henri Moisson, a French chemist who in 1884 took up the study of fluorine, turned his attention in 1892 to the development of the electric arc furnace. In an experiment involving carbon, Moisson claimed in 1893 to have synthesized diamonds in his furnace. He went on to win the Nobel Prize. At the end of runs, he would find that he had these glittering, clear, faceted crystals that he had produced in his material. And it turns out those faceted crystals looked a lot like diamonds. So Moisson said, I've made diamonds. And the world, because he was a Nobel Prize winner, believed him. Moisson actually produced silicon carbide, now renamed moissanite. Today, moissanite is marketed as a synthetic gemstone because it looks so much like a diamond, but sells for one-tenth the price. In 1913, William and Lawrence Bragg, a father-son team from England, used the new technology of X-ray crystallography to determine diamond's atomic structure. Building upon that knowledge, a Harvard physics professor began to take every material he could get his hands on, from water to wax, and put it under tremendous pressure. He would take alcohols and he would take gasoline, and again, you'd squeeze it and you'd make all sorts of new materials. That's what Percy Bridgman did. He, he did it better than anybody, and for, for four decades of research, he did this. Percy Bridgman never made diamonds, but he pointed the way for others. After World War II, the can-do generation that had built the bomb decided to put together a team at General Electric and figure out how to make synthetic diamonds once and for all. It was called Project Super Pressure. The General Electric team featured four lead scientists. And of those four, the most outspoken, perhaps the most brilliant, and certainly the most bitter is Tracy Hall. Tracy Hall didn't share his teammates' theory on how to make the best high-pressure device. The team wanted to use steel. Hall wanted carbide. Tracy Hall favored a more tapered design, a design called the belt, in which there was a donut-like apparatus which held the sample in place, and then two pistons which squeezed together on that sample. Of the team members, Herb Strong was Tracy Hall's greatest rival. 
In December of 1954, Strong made a run and claimed to have produced two small diamonds. When they were reanalyzed, it was found that the little fragments weren't man-made diamonds. They were tiny mine diamonds that had slipped into the run. Later that December, Tracy Hall, using his belt apparatus device and similar chemical principles that Herb Strong and others had developed, did his run. And there are countless tiny diamonds studded in his experimental run. And that indeed was the first time that humans had made diamonds in a way that was reproducible. For their effort, GE gave each of the lead scientists, including Tracy Hall, a $25 savings bond. The first synthetic diamonds were like little grains of sand. To make big diamonds, the scientists used a different strategy. If you begin your experimental run with a tiny crystal, a tiny diamond crystal, then that provides a place for other carbon atoms to attach. And if they attach slowly and methodically, the small crystal grows into a large crystal. GE discovered you can turn almost any carbon-based substance into diamonds, including peanut butter. The idea is to create an experimental environment of high temperature and high pressure. You have a sample that's composed primarily of carbon, and you want to take that sample and confine it very carefully so that it doesn't squirt out the sides of your apparatus. And you want to squeeze down on that sample using pieces of steel or carbide or even other diamonds in some cases. And then you want to apply tremendous pressure using a large press. And these presses can be 10 or 12 feet tall with thousands of tons of force applied to a very small area. The final step then is to turn on the electric juice and put current through the sample, which heats it up to extremely high temperature while it's at pressure. Electric current passes through two of the opposed anvils and the sample. In a few minutes, the pressure and temperature work their miracle. The cube, now smaller and gray from the heat, is smashed apart by a hammer. This black diamond can be used to attach to a drill bit that can break up solid rock. Early on, all synthetic diamonds were earmarked for industry. Now, perfect gem quality diamonds are man-made in the laboratory, and they are for sale. A one carat synthetic diamond sells for $600. A comparable mine diamond sells for $5,500. What other surprises do diamonds hold for us? Dr. Roy Lewis, a senior scientist at the University of Chicago who spent his career measuring the noble gas xenon and meteorites, stumbled upon diamonds through the back door. The meteorites that they're found in are as old as the Earth, but the diamonds came from stars before our solar system formed. So they're older than the Earth. They're diamonds. They ought to be worth something. If I could get a penny apiece for them, I could retire the national debt. Lewis keeps his pre-solar diamond grains in a vial. He says he has 50 quadrillion. That's five followed by 16 zeros. These diamonds that I get are formed in the atmospheres of stars. So this is a fairly high temperature, but actually quite low pressure. They're carbon atoms, just like the, the, the diamonds in the Earth, and they are in the same arrangement, one with respect to the other. These so-called nano-diamonds are so tiny, it is impossible to measure them individually. The diamonds are all found in the dark gray matter that's between every single piece that you can see on this thing. But if you throw this thing in a big bucket of hydrofluoric acid, most of it dissolves. If you do a size separation, you end up with diamonds. This photograph of the aggregate space diamonds looks like a sea of black. Each black speck is one diamond. I'm probably shedding diamonds as we speak because the, there are so many of these diamonds and they're so small. I am certainly contaminated with these diamonds. Now that's a condition few would complain about. It's no wonder diamonds are so prized, given the journey they make. Blasted from deep inside the earth, sifted from the sand, or vacuumed off the ocean's bed. These rough stones are sorted and sawed, ground and polished to fiery perfection. They're at once an indispensable tool of industry and the world's most coveted of jewels. They will always fascinate us. Diamonds. It was truly an unidentified flying object.